Have you ever wondered how we see things? Why our vision develops the way it does? Why do we see the world the way we do? These are some of the questions that are at the heart of psychophysics as well as a little bit of neuroscience. Today, we are going to talk about an impactful paper in psychophysics and neuroscience that probes some of these questions, and it involves cats. This video made possible thanks to viewers and patrons like you. Welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing a patron topic pick. If you would like to vote on future patron topic picks, swing by my Patreon and you can vote there. So as you can tell from the video title, today we are talking about cats, but what is this horizontal and vertical business? We are going to be going through the results of work by Blakemore and Cooper on the development of vision, specifically in cats. In this context, development means the maturation process involved in going from baby to adult. Turns out, not all organisms pop out with fully developed vision. As a note, in the last video where we covered a single experiment, I spent a bit of time going through the usual sections in a psychology paper. And the experiment we're talking about today does still sort of follow the intro method results discussion flow, but given the journal format, it's a bit different. Papers published in journals like Nature or Science will still generally follow this flow of information, especially if they're written by a psychologist, but the discrete section headings might be missing. So as another note, journals like Nature and Science are top tier journals. If you recall from the God Helmet video, I said that psychologists tend to consider an impact factor for a journal of about three to be good. And impact factor, if you forgot, is roughly how many times a paper from that journal will be cited in other papers on average. So an impact factor of three means that on average, a paper published in that journal will be cited three-ish times, give or take. Nature and science are both in the 40s. You truly have bragging rights as a scientist when your work gets into one of these journals. For reference, today's paper, published in Nature, has been cited almost 600 times. You could say it was influential. Before getting to the experiment, let's talk a little bit about perception and history. So studying perception is one of the older fields of psychology. Psychophysics was founded officially in 1860 by Fechner, although he was inspired by Weber's work earlier in the century. For comparison, cognitive, which is my field of study, only really kicked off in the 1960s. For a bigger scale perspective though, something like physics has been around for at least a millennia, so it's all relative. Anyways, a lot of the psychophysical time between the 1860s and the 1970s was spent trying to figure out how our perception relates to the physical stimuli that lead to those percepts. So the wavelength or intensity of light, wavelength or intensity of sound, intensity or nature of touch, yada yada yada. But how does our thinking noodle factor into all of this? Our understanding of how the brain works really came into its own in the 20th century. So neurotransmission, action potentials, synapses, stuff like that came from research from the 1950s and the 1960s. Around the same time period, people got interested in how perception relates to brain activity. This is something that always staggers me. So much of our understanding of how the brain works is less than 100 years old. So I remember in high school, sequencing the human genome was like the big exciting thing. And as far as high school me was concerned, we mostly understood how the brain worked and the function and the areas and all of that. It seemed like old hat information to me at the time. But when you start digging into this and start looking at the dates for things, you see how relatively young this information is. Anyways, the big step prior to the paper that we're talking about today established what are called feature detectors. And that leads us nicely into the next section of the video. Feature detectors are nerve cells in the brain, so neurons, that respond to particular attributes of a stimulus. So different attributes or features that you can expect are things like shape, so flat, round, 
wavy, that sort of thing. Uh, orientation, if it's standing up, if it's laying down, or even movement. So as an example, a line that's moving this way will have a different population of feature detectors firing than a line that's moving this way. These were discovered somewhat accidentally by Hubel and Weasel, but that's a story for another day. Recall that we tend to talk about neurons firing. This means that the neuron is going off and that it's indicating or communicating to whatever neurons it's connected to that something it is sensitive to has occurred. This is an all or nothing process. A neuron can't be indecisive. Either it is firing or it isn't. You can't shoot half a bullet. The way a neuron communicates is the rate of firing. Neurons will occasionally fire randomly. This is known as its base rate of firing. So for the neuron to indicate that something is happening for surezies, it needs to fire at a higher rate than its base rate. Now let's conceptually tie feature detectors and neuronal firing together. And as another side note, researchers in this time period would frequently hook up their electrode that they measured the action potentials with to their oscilloscope and then to a speaker so they could just hear whenever an action potential is happening. And so we'll be using that in this example too. Let's say we're looking at a feature detector sensitive to vertical lines in your central vision. When something with a vertical line appears in that feature detector's area, it starts firing at a rate much greater than its base rate. As this object being looked at moves away from vertical, the firing rate decreases. So if something is fully horizontal, this feature detector will return to its base rate of firing. Another thing to mention is the flow of information for visual stuff at a general level. At some point in the future, I do want to go through all of this stuff at a greater detail, but for now, broad level. Light enters the eye and is hopefully focused on the back of the eye. There, the photons interact with the light sensitive cells called photoreceptors, causing those to fire. From there, the information is carried along the optic nerve past the optic chiasm where some of the info changes sides through the thalamus and back to the visual cortex. Once the info gets into the visual cortex, the relatively simple information that enters the visual cortex is built up in complexity until it is passed on to other areas for more processing. The stuff we'll be talking about today are relatively early features. Early, simple features are things like orientation. Uh, for comparison, a more complex feature would be motion. Last piece of background info is the idea of critical periods. A critical period is a time during development when an organism is more sensitive to certain stimuli or more easily able to pick things up, like language. For visual things, a critical period is a stretch in time when the brain is essentially trying to fine tune its ability to process visual information based on the hardware it's attached to, so your eyes. During these time periods, it's super critical that the brain be getting that information it needs to be able to fine tune things, otherwise those areas that it's trying to tune may be underdeveloped or even taken over by neighboring areas. The brain's kind of efficient in a scary way like that. Examples you might be familiar with involve kids. So if a kid's born with something wrong with their corneas, it's really important to get that sorted. Maybe just remove the corneas altogether, maybe do a corneal transplant, maybe just try to correct with glasses. In any event, just to get them to be able to see out of their eyes so they can develop normal vision. Another example is a kid with a lazy eye. You know, you put an eye patch on the non-lazy eye so that it makes them use that lazy eye and sort of train it to not be lazy. But during that process, it's important to give them periods where they don't have the eye patch on because if you don't, you'll basically be trading one functional eye with the other one ignored for a functional eye with the other one ignored. Also, you need to be able to have both eyes open and be getting information from both in order to develop normal binocular vision. Binocular vision means just with both eyes. So related to this is having average normal eyes. So frequently, kids are screened for eye abnormalities, but I had an astigmatism that wasn't caught. Like I had 20-10 vision for the longest time, so they didn't even bother with the astigmatism stuff because I never saw an eye doctor. And as a consequence, there's a depth area that's just, nope, I can't really determine depth there. So 
I am frequently hit in the face with balls when doing sports. A book I'd like to go through at some point, Crashing Through, illustrates the importance of these critical periods. Briefly, the book's subject had normal vision, messed up his corneas as a kid, the outer focusing part of your eye, then was able to get corneal transplants as an adult. He had some interesting visual difficulties when able to see again. Now, on to the cats. In this experiment, the authors were interested in more normal but still controlled development of vision than some contemporary researchers were doing. The other research involved kitty goggles that only allowed in vertical light in one eye and horizontal in the other. Sort of like if you were looking through horizontal window blinds with one eye and vertical door blinds with the other, all the time since you could see. This was done to see the impact on the visual cortex organization, which could then indicate more about how it's organized normally or how it's organized during development. They found that this interfered with the development of normal binocular vision, meaning coming from both eyes. Blakemore and Cooper, the authors of today's paper, were also interested in the behavioral correlates of this abnormal development. And here's where we get to the depressing side of this type of research. A lot of what we understand about how the visual cortex is organized is through invasive techniques like single cell recording. In single cell recording, a microelectrode is inserted into the brain to measure the voltage of a neuron. This can then indicate when the neuron is firing. In these types of experiments, the electrode will be moved around so many neurons will be recorded from during the course of the experiment. How this ends up being represented in the research we're talking about today is the preferred orientation of those feature detectors. That'll make more sense later. But sticking electrodes into the brain is risky business. This isn't something you do on a whim, even in animals, because you are potentially introducing foreign matter into the brain, which can lead to death. The other facet of this research is that the best way to understand the physical nature of the brain area you're looking at and where your electrode went is to dissect the brain and directly look at it, which requires the sacrifice of whatever animal you were testing. So the feature detector paper I talked about earlier used single cell recording techniques and dissection. The kitty goggle experiment went from that abnormal development period right into single cell recording and dissection without really stopping to see how the cats interacted with the world along the way. In the experiment we're talking about today, the kittens were allowed normal use of both eyes. So normal is in air quotes because they weren't wearing goggles or any other things attached to them and they got to use both eyes normally, but the visual environment that they were raised in was highly controlled and highly not natural. From birth to about two weeks old, they were in complete darkness. At two weeks, for roughly five hours a day, they were put into the space. Now the authors didn't call it that, but it's my video, so I am. The space was an enclosed area where everything the cat could see was stripes of a particular orientation, horizontal or vertical. The enclosure of the space was round, so there would be no sharp edges like corners or door frames or anything. The floor was plexiglass and raised above the actual ground. This was so that all the kitten could see was the stripes. The kitten was also fitted with a special cone of shame that prevented the kitten from moving its head around too much or from seeing its body. The authors reported that the kittens did not seem upset by the monotony of their surroundings and they sat for long periods inspecting the walls of the tube. This alternating pitch black to the space routine was stopped when the kittens were five months old because that was past the critical period of visual development for cats. And at that point, it was time for testing. The kitten's eyes functioned normally, but they didn't seem to respond to visual information like a normal kitten would. They didn't place when put near a surface. Basically, cats and dogs will try to reach out for a surface when you're holding them and bring them near one. These kittens weren't doing that. They didn't respond to things being shoved towards their face. They also didn't really seem to be using visual info to interact with the world, but instead relied on touch and sound. These observed abnormal behaviors shifted to those of a normally sighted kitten after about 10 hours of exposure to a normal visual environment. So placing would happen when brought near a surface, they'd react to things moving toward their face, and they were able to use visual information to interact with the world. But not everything was normal. Basically, these cats were functionally blind to the orientation that they hadn't been exposed to. 
The cats, who had seen horizontal stripes, could navigate stairs or the ends of tables, but would walk or run right into table legs or other vertical things. The cats who had seen vertical stripes could successfully avoid table legs, but would walk off table edges or stairs. This extended to the kitten's ability to play. Horizontal cats could play with horizontal rods, but not vertical, and vice versa for the vertical cats. Although I'm not seeing it in this paper, I was taught by my psychophysics perception professor that with enough time, these kittens were able to behaviorally overcome these visual deficits. So let's say you have a vertical cat it was exposed to those vertical bars. And so it can do the table legs and everything just fine, but not the ed edges of tables. And so you have a cat going into an unfamiliar environment. Maybe there's stairs, maybe there's tables, maybe it doesn't know. And so what it does is it walks around the room slowly and when it thinks something might be up, it tilts its head. And so it's using the feature detectors it has developed, which we'll talk about in a second, to basically like see if there's any horizontal features hiding from it. By tilting its head, it's able to get whatever feature detectors it has developed, able to pick up the features in the environment that it might've been missing, and then it can continue. The kittens were transitioned into the neurophysiology portion of the experiment when they were three quarters of a year old. They were anesthetized to hold still, and their eyes were temporarily paralyzed with succinylcholine. Their eyes were also corrected to normal vision, given the succinylcholine. No kittens had any indication of astigmatism, which could have thrown off measurements. Electrodes were introduced into areas related to the binocular orientation feature detectors, similar to Hirsch and Spinelli's work. In a kitten who has had entirely normal visual experience, there will be a mostly uniform representation in the feature detectors of the different orientation preferences. If you think back to that vertical feature detector example we went through earlier, that vertical feature detector will have the strongest firing response rate to vertical features and less so as you move away from vertical. In a normal development situation for cats or even humans, you'll have feature detectors for vertical, horizontal, and everything in between. So you'll get the strongest firing response rate for that feature detector's preferred orientation and it'll drop off as you move away from that preference. This was not the case for the horizontal and vertical cats, however. The horizontal cats had the horizontal feature detectors, plus some above and below horizontal, but were missing the vertical feature detectors. Likewise, the vertical cats had vertical feature detectors, but were missing the horizontal feature detectors. The authors concluded, Evidently, the visual experience of these animals in early life has modified their brains, and there are profound perceptual consequences but we do not think that there is merely passive degeneration of certain cortical neurons because of underactivity. For we did not notice any obvious large regions of silent cortex corresponding to the missing cortical columns. It seems instead that the visual cortex may adjust itself during maturation to the nature of its visual experience. Cells may even change their preferred orientation towards that of the commonest type of stimulus, so perhaps the nervous system adapts to match the probability of occurrence of features in its visual input. This idea that the visual system could be shaped or tuned by the environment was huge. So instead of the visual system developing in a set normal trajectory and maybe abnormalities happening for some unknown reason, the environment could have a huge impact on how the visual system developed. This is one of those things that seems like uh, obvious at this point, but at the time it wasn't understood. So that was the tale of the horizontal and vertical cats and what they taught us about how our brains are wired. I'm honestly just as keen to talk about perceptual stuff as I am cognitive, so if this was interesting, give this video a like and tell me in the comments what sort of stuff you'd be interested in seeing in the future. Until next time, bye!